Okay, well, if not, then we will begin with 2 Corinthians. Uh, why are we studying the book? Every time we start a new book, we do a similar uh, outline or template to do just a basic introduction on different things about the epistle, why we're studying it, uh, who wrote it, what's the purpose of the book, the general theme. And this book, more than others, I think we benefit from this. Uh, in fact, I, I thought about spending two weeks on introduction, uh, but decided against it. But it's really important to take a big picture view at the whole book, because the Second Corinthians, as we'll see as we go through it, it's very easy, uh, because there's so many different topics in the book, to take the topics out of the context of the book and just study those. And so it's really important to understand in 2 Corinthians what the overall purpose of this epistle is, why Paul wrote it. Because uh, in between these popular quotable passages in this epistle are verses and verses that people just skip right over. They're not stories, they're not really doctrinal, uh, it's more of just Paul's talking. It's just kind of strange, and yet people skip over that. But we learn a lot about Paul's personality, a lot about the way he responds to different situations in these verses in between what people see as popular topics in this epistle. So uh, that'll be one of the uh, benefits of today's introductory lesson. But first, why did we choose this book? Well, it is one of the few of Paul's epistles we haven't done yet, so that... that uh, is a motivation. But also, um, there's reasons why I studied this book specifically, uh, not the least of which is to understand how grace works. Uh, whenever you think of the Corinthians in the Bible, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the whole church, uh, the epistles Paul writes to them, the a reason why uh, Paul is writing these epistles is to see grace work in them. Uh, grace, of course, doesn't require your works to be saved. Uh, and yet, grace to do ministry requires you expend effort to give it to others. Uh, the Corinthians, who heard and received God's grace and knew about the liberty they had in Christ, uh, did not put that into charitable practice in 1 Corinthians. We studied that uh, in our book uh, some years ago. Uh, if you read the 1 Corinthians, you know that's the truth. 2 Corinthians follows a similar theme in that he's trying to get the Corinthians to put their grace to work. Um, but he does so in a unique way in 2 Corinthians, unlike 1 Corinthians where he's uh, hearing reports and then writing this 1 Corinthian epistle to rebuke them and correct them and, and uh, a general format as you would see in other epistles as well. 2 Corinthians is interesting in that it's unique. We'll get to that in a little bit. But anyway, the, the, the purpose of studying it may be to understand how grace works or grace abounds in ministry. We also could realize that we also as the Corinthian environment, live in a flesh-driven, self-centered, temporal, wealthy, very artistic, uh, Corinthian place and time uh, in, in history, okay? Uh, where we're at on the globe and, and just in history where we're at. Uh, very much having kind of the Corinthian spirit and, and influence. Um, so we can take a, a lesson from these books very personally and making sure that we are taking grace and making it work in us so that we avoid the errors and pitfalls. We're also going to study this book to read about the proving of Christian ministers under grace, which is a very interesting thing we'll be seeing in 2 Corinthians, as Paul uh, defends his own ministry in this epistle all throughout. And so in so doing, we find a way, an example, as Paul says elsewhere, a pattern for Christian ministry and Christian ministers. And so uh, we'll see how that operates uh, in this dispensation. We'll also see, uh, hopefully, as we approach the end of the year, it's in the forefront of my mind, uh, how to evaluate and align our ministry uh, in God's grace with the right heart, which is going to be a common theme in 2 Corinthians. It's going to be a deep book in the sense that it's not dealing with superficial fleshly things, more as it is Paul examining his own heart and looking deeper past the surface to the motivations and the intents the intents and the thoughts of why he's doing things. Um, so in that way, it's going to go past the surface a little bit, very, very deep in that regard. Okay? Uh, and also, we're going to benefit, as I pointed out, from the context of popularly quoted verses. Second Corinthians, many of you may have some verses in your, in your mind from the book that you've memorized. Um, many other verses you have not. In fact, if you stop and think about it, you may not know what the context is the verses you have memorized are in, really. Uh, you use them quite often, we use them quite often, but why in the world are they there in that book? Uh, much more uh, in the foref in forefront of my mind constantly, and, and hopefully yours as well, is, is a book like Romans, Romans 1 through 8, where you can almost say what is in Romans 3 and Romans 4 and Romans 5 and Romans 6 and, and Ephesians. You know what's in Ephesians 3 and you know what's in Ephesians 5. 
2 Corinthians, often when you recall it in your mind, in people's minds, it's, it's vague. The chapter numbers aren't so definitive. The topics isn't so consistent. Paul seems to be going here and there and everywhere. And it's very hard for people to outline and to, to the study like other books. But uh, we'll benefit from going through it verse by verse to see what is the context of these popular verses. Okay, So that's why we're studying this book. Hopefully it will be a very profitable study for us as a church, as a group of people in Christ. Um, to learn from the Corinthians and from Paul. All right, let's cover some details about the book as we do. Details. This is Paul's third largest epistle behind Romans and 1 Corinthians. In case you didn't know, the New Testament epistles are ordered by author, uh, type, and size. That's how they're ordered. And so you'll, it's not a coincidence that you see Romans, the biggest, and then Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and so on and so forth, down to Philemon, the shortest of Paul's epistles, and then you, you, if you ever wondered why Hebrews is so big and it's so, uh, it jumps from finding a real small book to Hebrews because Hebrews was segregated, it not being put under uh, the Pauline epistles, those 13 books. And then it goes from Hebrews to Jude and Revelation being the final book. So that's how they're ordered in the New Testament. Uh, it's also not coincidence that the books are ordered that way in Paul's epistles uh, in order of growth. <laughs> it's interesting. You start with Romans. And Philemon, though small as it is, is, is a very advanced application of God's grace. And so you kind of grow through the reading of Paul's epistles, which is very interesting. Meanwhile, it's the third largest epistle. By the time you, you read uh, 2 Corinthians, you have read half of Paul's writings, which is interesting. Just to think about the n- number of words, uh, because the later epistles are so small. But not only just in the Bible uh, canon, but also in the context of when Paul wrote 2 Corinthians. When he wrote 2 Corinthians, he had almost written half of his inspired epistles already. Okay, so uh, you had 3rd, 2nd Thessalonians, Galatians, uh, Romans written about the same time, 1 Corinthians already, and now he's writing 2 Corinthians. And so even in the dispensational context, you'll have uh, most of Paul's writing already complete. There's 13 chapters, 257 verses, and 6,065 words. Uh, we will cover every verse. Um, hopefully we'll try not to skip a word, but we probably will. Um, the audience of the book. Uh, it's to the saints in Corinth, as we see in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, and to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints, which are in all Achaia. So to the whole group down there in Achaia, uh, southern Greece, Corinth, uh, Centria, and those places, uh, Corinth, if we just do a matter of review, and you can look this up in any Bible dictionary, uh, Corinth is, it was a city renowned for its uh, wealth, for its art. Um, technologically, it was re- known for its shipyards and shipbuilding and that sort of thing. And also its competition. It was constantly in competition for being the chief city in the Mediterranean, uh, at least around the Grecian area and the, the Asian area. So in competition with Ephesus and these other places, which we'll see come out in the book, as Paul, when he did his ministry, spent time in Ephesus, in fact, spent a lot more time in Ephesus than in Corinth. And we see the Corinthians respond to this, in a sense. So, a very competitive city, um, a wealthy city, an advanced city for the time, and a very artistic city. You still see and hear about Corinthian pillars, right? Corinthian architecture. That's still something people use. It comes from the Corinthians that we're reading about here. So this was the type of, of culture that they were in. Um, this is going to come up in the problems that they have spiritually, okay? Because they're going to prioritize and glory in appearances and things that look good, which is what they were doing in their culture. Hopefully you can see a connection between that in our culture in America, where people uh, are give more credence and glory to things that look good because we do have design in our culture. We do do, uh, take art as something that we appreciate in beauty in our culture because we have the wealth and time to do so. And so um, when you have ministries that look a lot better, people give them credibility. Paul's going to deal with that in 2 Corinthians. Uh, The same thing with money and wealth. You know, what do you do with... uh, uh, people who are po- poverty stricken. You know, is that a, a, a good ministry or a bad ministry? Well, Second Corinthians deals with these sorts of things as well. So it's appropriate. This is the audience. Um, interestingly, as we've studied uh, different of Paul's epistles, almost in every epistle Paul writes, he talks about Jews and Gentiles. Right? You see it come up once or twice, especially in his earlier epistles. First Corinthians, he dealt with it a lot. 
because he was describing the body of Christ and how there's no Jew or Gentile in the body of Christ, right? In Ephesians, we studied that, remember, in chapter 2, where in time past there were uncircumcision and circumcision and all that business. In 2 Corinthians, interestingly, he never brings it up. It's not something he, he brings up, the Jew and Gentile difference, Jew and Greek. In fact, Gentiles and Greek, the words aren't even mentioned in the book. Jews aren't, except for one place, and that's where Paul says that the Jews are received 30 nine stripes, or 30 stripes saved once. So he mentions the Jews who were unbelieving, whipping him. You know, it's the only time in the whole book a, a Jew is mentioned. Um, and so I only bring that up to, to show you something about the content of the book. Uh, it, the, the word mystery doesn't appear in this book. What we're going to find in this book is the teaching, the doctrine of the mystery. It's going to abound everywhere. Okay, it's going to be everywhere in this book. Um, and this is going to be important for you to discern, because uh, when people uh, are new to right division, are new to the revelation of the mystery and what that is, um, they, they hinge so much on the word, not understanding the meaning that, it, that, that comes behind it. But when you understand what the mystery is, as we learn in Ephesians, for example, that it is the body of Christ, and what that means for your operation, that you're not Israel, not under the law, not under covenants, and you start thinking about how to apply that truth to your everyday living. You read 2 Corinthians, and Paul is going to be exemplifying this throughout. And so you see mystery doctrine working in Paul in this book. So it's very interesting. Meanwhile, uh, that is the audience. It is to the church in Corinth. Uh, he doesn't make a distinction between Jew and Gentile, though no doubt there are Jews and Gentiles there, a mixed crowd. What about the uh, when, the dispensational context of this book? Well, it's years after his first visit to Corinth. And that's going to have an impact on why he's writing the book. Um, he's writing this epistle years after he first visited Corinth. Remember he first visited Corinth in Acts chapter 18? Acts 18, he went there. And uh, he went to the synagogue, remember, they rejected him. And then he went to the house next to the synagogue, Crispus's and Gaius's place there, and baptized a few of them as they believed. And then uh, started that church there in, in Corinth. Um, Paul was the first to go to Corinth with the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the grace of God. Um, and so he, he went there in Acts chapter uh, 18. Um, look at Acts chapter 20. It was in Acts chapter 19 that Paul wrote his first epistle back to the Corinthians. You recall he left Corinth in Acts 18. He traveled over to Ephesus, to Asia. And then eventually he went back to Jerusalem and came back uh, north through Antioch and then back to Asia and Ephesus. And this is going to be part of, again, why his epistle is written. If I can draw a crude map here. Greece, Asia, and here is Israel over here. Here's Israel, here's Antioch, here's Asia and Ephesus here, right? And then you have uh, Greece over here and Philippi and Thessalonia up here, okay? The Corinthians are down here. I know there's islands and things, but the Corinthians are here. Are you with me? You memorize all those dots in the Ephesians? The Corinthians. And so what's happening is Paul, uh, when he went to the Corinthian church in Acts 18, he left to go to Asia. He eventually went back to Jerusalem and came back to uh, what people call his third journey. But in Acts 19, he's in Ephesus here. And the choice he has is either to travel across the ocean to the Corinthian church or head north through Macedonia, which is up here. Macedonia is where the Philippian church was at and where the Thessalonians were at. Okay, the Corinthians were way down here on this peninsula. And so um, in Acts 19, uh, in Ephesus, if you recall, there was so much opposition to Paul's ministry that the theory is that he could not or chose not to because of that to travel through the sea. And so he traveled north to escape and then went to the churches up here. But uh, if you look at Acts 20, verse 1, 2, and 3, after the uproar was ceased, that's in Ephesus, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. This is Acts chapter 20. They were here. There was an uproar in Ephesus. Remember, great is Diana of the Ephesians. When it ceased, he travels north. Now, this is going to be an offense to the Corinthians because uh, Paul had told the Corinthians that he would return to them. And by going north instead of just directly west, he's spending so much time to do so 
In fact, even in Ephesus in Acts 19, verse 10, it says he was there for at least two years. This continued by the space of two years that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks in Asia. At least two years, probably more like three or four years spent in Asia, not of going to Corinth. He comes back and he's so close to Corinth, instead he goes north way around. That's going to be a lot more months added on to the tally. Okay. And so in Acts 20, verse 2 and 3, is where we will put the writing of 2 Corinthians. As it says in verse 2, He departed to go to Macedonia, and when they had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece. Now Greece is down here, so probably he came down south, right? Uh, it never says he went to Corinth here, which is a matter of some dispute. But it did say he went to Greece, and there abode three months. That's it. Three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, he was about to sail into Syria. He purposed to return through Macedonia. So he was going to cross back over to Ephesus and said he went back up. And so you'll see the maps of his journey. He comes over here and he goes back up instead of traveling over the ocean. Right? So three months he was in Greece. Doesn't even say he was in Corinth. People speculate about whether he was or not. All this leads to the situation that the Corinthian church who Paul established was there for about a year and a half and then left um, and then later wrote an epistle to them instead of showing up in person. And that epistle was a rebuke of them, right? Uh, the situation the Corinthians find themselves in is how to respond to this Paul, right? He came and started something. He left. He wrote us an epistle rebuking us sternly, right? How are we going to receive this? Well, we'll see that in a moment, how that works. But look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. We're going to put the writing of, of 2 Corinthians and Acts chapter 20, verse... Uh, Three, two or three there, based on these verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, where Paul mentions this event. We would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, and so much that we despaired even of life. Well, that's the great uproar over there in Acts chapter 19, right? We have the sentence of death in ourselves, verse 9 says. Uh, over in uh, verse 16, it says that they, he had the mind, in verse 15, to come unto you before, that you might have a second benefit of his presence, that is, uh, and to pass by you into Macedonia. So the thought was to come by Corinth and then go up to Macedonia. Right? That's what he said that his mind was to do. In fact, that's probably what the Corinthians were expecting. But he said he didn't. He said, uh, and to pass by you into Macedonia, to come again out of Macedonia unto you, and then out of you to be brought on my way to Judea. So you'd go there first, up to Macedonia, come back to them, and then sail back to to Judea. Uh, when I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness? Well, we'll cover that later, but drop down to verse uh, 23. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you, I came not as yet into Corinth. So you see, Paul didn't go. And even says in this epistle, I came in order to spare you. So you what? His further rebuke. Because <laughs> he already rebuked them once in an epistle already. This no doubt uh, is not encouraging to them, but it tells us a little bit about the context of the book. Chapter 7, verse 5, Paul goes on to explain, and he says in chapter 2 as well, uh, his interactions with Titus. When we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. So apparently, Paul went to Macedonia, and had sent Titus ahead of him down to Corinth, and Titus returned back to Paul. So even at this point, 2 Corinthians 7, which is where he writes the epistle from Macedonia down to Corinth, Paul hadn't visited Corinth, right? And so, what do you think about that as a Corinthian, you know? Chapter 8, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. He's in Macedonia. He's talking about this. Chapter 9, verse 2 through 4, I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago. And so he's talking about Macedonia, and that's where he's at, uh, boasting to them about the Corinthians. Okay. So this is where we put the book uh, in Acts 22 and 3 there, towards the end of Paul's ministry in the book of Acts. And uh, some years after his first visit to Corinth, probably about a year or so after his first epistle, which he rebuked them. And that brings us to the purpose. Why did Paul write this epistle? In fact, it's the only book that, or let's say the, the longest book that he, he writes um, 
to a church, a second letter to a church. Right? You have the Thessalonians, he writes two letters, but they're pretty short. In the Corinthians, he writes two long letters. Combined, they make uh, nearly a third or more of Paul's writing in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. But um, why is he writing this epistle? The first one, of course, was written because he had heard and received a letter that there were problems, behavioral problems in Corinth. And so he writes this epistle of rebuke. He says in 1 Corinthians that he had heard. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 5? And as he begins the rebuke there, he says, it is reported commonly. Right? And then elsewhere he says, it was written to me and I heard from these people. And, and so he's hearing from others about the situation in Corinth and he's writing to them the first epistle. And that first epistle was scathing. Okay? Now you and I read it not being the Corinthians. Right? But if it was written to you, and you read 1 Corinthians as if it's written to you, uh, you might have the same problem that every human seems to have, which is that when someone tries to rebuke or correct you, immediately you are piling up your retaliation. Right? One of the most common retaliations when people try to rebuke or correct you, whether right or wrong, is to simply say, oh yeah, you too. <laughs> uh, which is a common fallacy, but this is, this is very easy, and uh, no doubt you can find something wrong about the other person. Right? So it's almost something about you that is wrong. You don't have to defend or justify or excuse or lie about it. You can simply say, well, yeah, you're no cupcake yourself. Right? And this is a common human, it's a very predictable human response. And this is what the Corinthians did in part. Paul rebukes them in 16 chapters. And apparently, they respond in part in retaliation to Paul, saying, well, look at you, Paul. Right? And look at your character. And look at your sin. And so this is part of the motivation for Paul writing 2 Corinthians. It's his response to that retaliation, right? Which is interesting because it shows Paul's maturity and how he responds. Secondly, it shows Paul's authority later in the epistle. But it also shows how grace works in Paul to respond to such a thing. Because he's being personally attacked in this book. Now you say, well, the Corinthians are being personally attacked. Well, that's what they thought. You say, Paul will explain this in 2 Corinthians. I wasn't attacking you. I'm trying to help you. In fact, in the scripture, it says, uh, a wise man loves rebuke, right? It takes some, uh, I don't know, spiritual strength maybe? Uh, some, some uh, willingness to grow, some humbleness of mind to realize when someone comes to you and says, look, you got some things you need to improve on here, right? To realize and to say, well, this is a great opportunity for me to learn and grow. Because no one naturally wants to do that. That takes uh, some cognition to, to say, you know what, I have problems. I accept that. Um, if someone's going to come and try to help me with those problems, then I'm going to eat the meat, spell out the bones. I'm going to see what I can do to, to advance myself, right? To, to better, to improve, right? Um, the selfish, the proud, the arrogant, whenever someone says you're doing something wrong, no, I'm not. Without even reasoning through it, without even thinking through it, no, I'm not. I do not do things wrong, and you're wrong to say I did something wrong. You know, this is natural, right? And so anyway, this is where we're at here. They received a very hard rebuke from Paul. In fact, I, I don't know if I have it on my outline here or not. Um, I'll, I'll get to it later in 1 Corinthians, how hard that rebuke was. But the response, the Corinthian response to the rebuke was mixed. Uh, and this is what makes 2 Corinthians a little confusing for many people, is that you don't know what in the world Paul's sentiment is. Is he responding positively to these Corinthians or negatively? And in fact, it's both. <laughs> and it seems like in every chapter he's going back and forth. Is he praising them? Is he not praising them? Is it, well, what's going on here? And so people have all sorts of theories about um, what he's thinking, but um, we'll try to stick as close as we can to the text while also trying to get the context. Um, the response was mixed, apparently. Uh, there was apparently some repentance. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul will talk about the repentance that he heard about in the Corinthian church. As Paul was in Macedonia, Titus was sent down to Corinthians to check up on him to make sure things were going okay. Titus comes back and gives a report to Paul in Macedonia. And this is where we pick it up in chapter 7. <clears throat> uh, down in verse 6. Uh, we read verse 6 before when Titus came and comforted Paul. Verse 7, not by his coming only was he comforted, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, Corinthians, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. Now those three things there are things specifically that Paul pointed out for their rebuke in 1 Corinthians, if you remember. Right? They denied his apostleship. Right? Uh, they didn't care about other people, their earnest desire. And uh, it says that uh, uh, they didn't mourn over sin in 1 Corinthians 5. 
They didn't mourn. That was the problem. It wasn't that there was sin in Corinth that was the problem. It was that there was sin and no one was mourning over it. They didn't care. But then the report back from Titus is, oh, they've got earnest desire, they're mourning, and they have fervent mind toward you, Paul. And Paul's going, this is great. This is great. So he's rejoicing. He says, verse 8, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. I, repent means a change of mind. It has nothing to do necessarily with sin. Though I did repent, he had at one point thought, maybe I shouldn't have wrote that. But he didn't. Uh, now that he's heard this news. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though were but for a season. So their sorrow was not perpetual. Verse 9, Now I rejoice that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. So the sorrow that you had from my letter brought you to a change of mind, which is what rebuke is supposed to do. Rebuke is supposed to not make you hard towards the person offering the rebuke. Rebuke offered in love is supposed to help the other person change their mind and thus they're realigned with what's right, you see. And so in verse 10, we'll get to that more in chapter 7. Godly sorrow, or verse 9 rather, he says, uh, Ye sorrow to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. And so rather than being damaged by the rebuke, uh, they weren't, they were helped by it, which is what God's intention is for rebuke. Verse 10, for godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, the sorrow of the world worketh death. So apparently there's this response, where there's this positive repenting, uh, of something, right? Um, a change of mind. In fact, he says elsewhere in verse 11, Behold this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, what zeal, what revenge. In all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. That's pretty, pretty nice. Uh, you would think the epistle would stop there. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys. A great report. You know, kind of like Thessalonians. We'd love to hear from you and uh, nice to hear that you're repenting. Um, but it doesn't because the issue in 2 Corinthians is not simply they had a change of mind. The issue has to do with why aren't they doing the work the change of mind requires. Hmm? You see, that's the difference between the Corinthian church and Thessalonian church. The Thessalonians church, Paul writes that I remember your labor of love, right? That's what's missing in the Corinthian church. They repent and say, yep, that's wrong. We're going to stop doing that. The desire, the zeal is there, apparently. Uh, they received that well. And then where's the labor? Well, Paul's looking for that. And in fact, they accuse Paul of not working right. And so he's going to offer them a little challenge. But So you see this positive response, this repentance and fervency to clear the matter. Although it sounds positive, you, you could also hear um, people responding this way when they've been rebuked. Um, in order to justify themselves, which is why Paul talks about godly sorrow and worldly sorrow, right? The worldly sorrow is you've been caught. The godly sorrow is that I have a change of mind. leads you to salvation, right? Um, was it that the Corinthians were responding because, whoops, they've been caught and uh, they wanted to make themselves look better? And so they're going to cover that up. They're going to stop that, right? Or is it actually they uh, heard the doctrine, it worked effectually in them, that uh, these things were dis to be despised? Well, that is yet to be seen. But however, the majority of the book uh, apparently deals with this negative response that came from the Corinthian church. Whether from the same people or other people, it's hard to say, because again, he doesn't speak to specific people. But uh, there's this retaliation with critiques and charges against Paul's character and his ministry, which is why he writes such a lengthy epistle. Is that they charge him with sin, with lying, with hypocrisy, with selfishness, with vanity, with, uh, with destroying them as saints of God, right? So these are large charges that Paul has to address. And this is what he's writing, it's like writing this about, is addressing these charges. And so what he has to do, and we'll, we'll get there in a moment, what he has to do is defend himself. What are these charges that they're uh, giving against Paul's character? We learn about these, not because we have a letter that the Corinthians wrote or anything like that, not because we heard Titus's report, but because we have in this epistle, Paul addressing the things that were said about him. Okay, so apparently he was accused of having secret motives, selfish ambition, being vain, meaning trying to benefit himself, right, not other people, and uh, being careless without care to people, right? Now, it's interesting. You might think, well, Paul, Paul, of course, this is a false accusation, right? But you think about how you know it's a false accusation, you'll find that much of the proof in your mind about how you know Paul isn't these things comes from this book, okay? So it's interesting. You ever heard the, the claim that Paul's arrogant? It, it, it exists, that Paul was arrogant, right? 
Um, you read in 2 Corinthians about his heart, and you find that he wasn't so much, right? But, um, so this is the, the nature of the book. Look at chapter 1, verse 13, for example. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 13. <clears throat> Paul says, we write none other things unto you. Now, let's back up to verse 12, just to get the context here. He says, our rejoicing is this. This is what we rejoice in. The testimony of our conscience. Our conscience. The thing that, you know, it's inside our head that I don't have to tell you about. The testimony. I'm going to tell you my conscience. Which means what? He's going to make it known, manifest, right? So if there's something not right in his conscience, unless he's lying, everyone will see it. But his rejoicing is that the testimony of his conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you words. His point is, I have a clear conscience towards you guys. That's what he's saying. I'm going to tell you my thoughts and I have a clear conscience. There was no vain, malicious motives here. Right? So I'm going to spill the beans, and you're going to hear it, and hopefully it's going to help you. Right? And that's what this is about. Verse 13, he says, For we write none other things unto you than what you read or acknowledge. What's he saying? He says, I'm going to tell you my conscience and sincerity and truth, right? And I, I'm not writing anything than what you're reading. It's not that when you read my epistle, there's some secret knowledge I'm keeping back and had a hidden agenda trying to get you to do something or to condemn you to benefit me. He says, what I write is what I want to say. That's what he's saying. I write none of the things than that which you read or acknowledge. And I trust you shall acknowledge even to the end. Right? Because the things that he writes are the commandments of the Lord, are, are the truth, and according to here, it's according to his conscience. It's what really he was thinking. Okay? So, the, one accusation against him was that he had things that, secret motives, hidden agendas. Right? Look at chapter 10, verse 2. Another accusation against him was that he walked in the flesh. That he was selfish. He was doing these things to uh, puff himself up. Remember in 1 Corinthians, there was a contention in the church of some people saying, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Paul, I'm of Christ, right? Interestingly, C.I. Schofield says in his introduction to 2 Corinthians, I thought it was a very interesting paragraph, he talks about the most dangerous sect of those four different sects. Some say I'm Apollos and Cephas and Paul and Christ are those who say I'm of Christ. That was the most dangerous sect. And Schofield writes in his in introduction, if you have Schofield notes, that the reason why it's dangerous is because those are people who didn't acknowledge the further revelation given to the Apostle Paul. Because if they're saying, I'm of Christ, in opposition to Paul, right, then they're not acknowledging that Christ revealed things to Paul, which means they're hearing Paul, uh, Jesus' message before the revelation of the mystery. They're walking under the law, as Jesus was born under, ministering the circumcision message, right? That's interesting. Schofield wrote that some hundred years ago in 2 Corinthians. But anyway... Getting back to the context here, 2 Corinthians 10, uh, in verse 1. I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. We'll get more into why he says that in the future, but it's somewhat sarcastic there. But, Who in presence am base among you, but being absent am bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. What's he saying? In some convolution there. He's saying that, I want, you claim that I'm bold when I'm not there, and I'm weak when I'm in person. And so I beseech you not to let me be bold when I'm with you, because if I'm bold when I'm with you, then I'll be bold to the people who think I walk up to the flesh, and you won't want that. Right? This is almost a threat. Right? Because he's been accused of walking after the flesh. Now this is after 10 chapters of him approving his own ministry which we'll study after 10 chapters of, what, of Paul's thoughts and why he's doing things and the motivations for his ministry, you'll see Paul was not walking after the flesh. His flesh was being killed and stoned and beaten and everything else. He was not walking after the flesh. Right? And yet he was accused of that. Right? You're walking after your flesh. This is Paul, wrote Galatians 5, right? Teaching the Galatians how to walk in the spirit and the flesh. And so uh, that was an accusation. Look at chapter 11, verse 11. You'll see that in this place in chapter 12 as well, the accusation that he was careless or without care. He's in verse 11, uh, why? Why is it that no one can stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia? Is it because I love you not? The only place in the entire Bible that you find the phrase, I love you, is in 2 Corinthians, about the Corinthian church. They're the ones that accused Paul of not being loving, specifically to them. 
And he says, why is it? And he goes through chapter 11, which we'll cover in the future. Is it because I love you not? He says, God, no, that's rhetorical. He says, of course I do. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, verse 15. It's the same thing. I will very gladly spend to be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Right? He says it twice to the Corinthian church. Nowhere else do you find that phrase, I love you. It's interesting. To the Corinthian church of all people. Right? Surely he would have said it to the Thessalonians, maybe, or the Philippians, but the Corinthians is where you find it. So he had these accusations here uh, of him being uh, selfish and careless without love. There's also accusations of him being hypocritical. Look at chapter 1, verse 23, of him saying that he's going to come and he doesn't. We already read verse 23 before. This has to do with uh, Paul explaining why he did not come to them. He says, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet into Corinth. It's not that he forgot or neglected or didn't or hated them. It's just to spare you. It was for their own good that I came not as yet to Corinth. Okay? They claimed he was a hypocrite. He, he said one thing and did another. He said he would come and wouldn't and didn't do it. Look at chapter 10, verse 10 and 11. They claimed that he was weak. And he had a poor speech, rude of speech, and bad appearances. And, and this is like personal attacks, right? And this isn't even doctrinal, which is what you would expect from carnal, immature people, or unbelievers, right? Um, it is something Christians do as well, and it's shameful. And this is what Paul's writing about in chapter 10, <clears throat> in verse 10. His letters, say they, are weighty and powerful. Remember 1 Corinthians? Heavy, right? Are weighty and powerful. But his bodily presence is weak, and his speech contemptible. And so when he's there in presence, not so much. So what do you call someone like that? A coward? That's what they're saying, right? That, yeah, big words for a guy who's miles away. Why do you say that to our face? You know? And, of course, he explains why he does that. And you'll see and when he explains and, and, and gives the, the motivations behind doing things that he's no coward. He walks into towns who stoned him before already, and he walks back into the town and to preach again in Acts 14, right? It's not that he lacks courage. It's that he's doing it for their benefit. And we'll see what, how that is. There's going to be a lot of this. Uh, this is why I said it was a deep book. Because it has a lot to do with motivations and the reasons why Paul does things. Not simply looking at the appearance of, of what has been done. Which is what we find a lot in, in our ministry. As well. I mean, just people's ministry in the church. Is that, that you can do this or that and people perceive what you do differently. But really what matters in the sight of God is the motivation for what you're doing. It also matters what you're doing but even more so why you're doing what you're doing. Because many other churches can do a similar thing that you do for a different reason. False teachers can do the similar thing as you do for a different reason. And that what makes them false is the motivation, right? So anyway, this is the claim here. Look at 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Covering these charges against Paul. This is the third time I am coming to you. In, uh, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Uh, I told you before uh, and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again I will not spare since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. What? Since you seek a proof? <laughs> you see, that's what they're charging him with. They denied that Christ could be speaking through him because of what he was doing and what, how he was behaving. Paul. No, no, Paul rebuked them in 1 Corinthians, and they respond back with, yes, Paul, thank you for telling us about those errors. They have been corrected. In fact, you exaggerated too much. The exaggeration, uh, the, the report of our sins have been grossly exaggerated, right? And we, we don't do this, and we don't do that, right? But you, Paul, have a few things to deal with, because apparently you, don't, you can't control your temper, you know? <laughs> apparently, you've got these problems in your ministry. It's their response, and these problems of hypocrisy, selfish ambition, vanity, Without love, you don't even come back to the Corinthian church for years. Right? This is the situation that they're in. And so in chapter 13, verse 3, they're seeking proof that Christ is even in them. I wrote on your outline here a couple modern sayings that people have the same accusation when they say things like, that doesn't sound very Christ-like. You ever heard this? A Christian wouldn't do that. This is the same accusation, I mean, in modern euphemism, that the Corinthians were giving to Paul. Paul read your epistle, and it doesn't sound like Christ at all, right? I mean, this is what they're saying, right? They're accusing him 
of wrong motives, selfishness, and everything else. And, and so um, this is what they're doing. They're, they're questioning Christ uh, speaking through him as an apostle, but also in, in the letter that he wrote. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, this is why early on in the book, you can, almost see, you can, you can read Paul almost restraining himself. Because he wants to once again lash them with a rebuke like 1 Corinthians. But instead, he kind of holds back and he's like, grace has got to work here. And in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we as some others epistles of condemnation to you or letters of commendation from you? I mean, then he kind of settles down a bit. But you see a lot of these kind of rhetorical questions throughout 2 Corinthians because he's just kind of thinking, what is this? Do I have to prove myself again to you? You know, and he goes on in 2 Corinthians 13 to, to, to say something very interesting. He says, you should examine yourselves. You seek a proof of Christ in me? Examine yourselves. If you're in Christ, it's because of me. That sounds arrogant, doesn't it? But it was. He was the first to preach the gospel in, the, in, in, in Corinth. He established the church. The reason why they were there was because he went there to minister. And they're claiming that he's doing things out of selfish re reasons. You know. And so it, it's, it's very ironic. Um, but again, something very typical that you might expect, and Paul would know that as well, from baby carnal Christians, which is what the Corinthians were in 1 Corinthians. And even if they had repented and grown some in the few years, perhaps they hadn't grown too much. As Paul will point out, he went to Macedonia, and the Macedonians in their poverty did more ministry work and gave more to Paul of their time and their lives than the Corinthians did. You know, the Corinthians were wealthier and maybe bigger as a church. And so you'll find all of this in 2 Corinthians. It's interesting study. Um, the letter then in 2 Corinthians is Paul's defense of all these accusations. Let's, let's run through a few verses here to see how we know it's, a, it's Paul defending himself. In 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17, some of these verses you may be familiar with. They're popular verses. I'm putting them in the greater context of the book and maybe they'll pop out now why Paul is saying this. 2 Corinthians 2 17, he says, We are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Now, people take that verse, and we've used it as well, talking about corrupting the Word of God, and how we don't corrupt the Word of God. That's the instruction. And yes, there's the verse right there saying we don't corrupt the Word of God. But why is Paul saying it? Paul is saying it. He's being accused of corrupting the Word of God and accused of not speaking Christ's words. Right? And he says, I'm serious. The Word of God came to me, and I'm speaking in Christ. Right? That's what he's saying here. He says, I'm not like these other teachers that corrupt the Word of God. Christ spoke to me directly. You see, and there are teachers corrupting the word of God, which he'll deal with later in the epistle. Look at chapter four, verse two, the same reason why he brings it up again here. He says, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Why would he say that? Because he's been accused of being dishonest. Paul, you're a liar. Guys, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in crashness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. This is his response. Paul's like, this is what I've dedicated my life to. Now, what, just to step back and have a little application here, what an amazing statement to make. Okay? If you and I were to make such a statement, there may be some sort of a doubt in our own mind. <laughs> have we really renounced? I mean, surely we're against it, but it's like renouncing. This is like a life statement here. And that's what Paul's saying, right? And not only that, but he's manifest in every man's conscience. Is this something we could say about ourselves, right? So you see how this book, learning about Paul and his manner of life and ministry, we can learn from of how we ought to minister, right? Dishonesty, handling the word of God deceitfully ought to be so uh, uh, abhorrent to us that we can walk in such a way and live in such a way in ministry that we can make this statement openly and boldly to people without fear of someone going, you're lying by saying that, right? But he says this because... He said in chapter 1, remember? I rejoice that the testimony of my conscience is clear. I can tell you my conscience and, and sincerity, and I am not mishandling the Word of God. Right? And so, what a testimony to have. But move on to chapter 5, verse 12. We commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. The in heart has to do with grace working in them, which we'll do with in as we get through the book, but there are people who glory in appearance there in Corinthian and Corinth, and Paul says, um, we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion of glory on our behalf. So he's giving them defense again. Uh, they're giving, he's giving them a defense of him against people who are accusing him. Right? Look at chapter 6, verse 3. 
He beseeches the Corinthians and he says, giving no offense in anything, the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. Well, why does he have to prove himself to anyone? He doesn't. First Corinthians 4 says he's judged of no man, remember? But he does here because he loves the Corinthian church. He's been accused of things by maybe a, a certain group of some people uh, in the area or, or around, and he's defending himself to these people. <clears throat> and so, chapter 10, verse 12, all through the book, it's the same, the same theme. We dare not make ourselves of the number, as he's defending himself, he says, we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves amongst themselves are not wise. He's not making a comparison between him and someone else. Well, studying in chapter 3, he even says, I don't preach myself. God is sufficient for the ministry that I do. It's not me that I preach in chapter 4. It's Christ and his glory. So you can accuse me of any personal you know, lack that you want, but Christ is glorious, and he's perfect, and that's who I preach, you see. And so the proper response to personal attack is to say, well, it's not me, it's Christ. That, that comes from 2 Corinthians, right? And, and that's what he's saying here. But he's saying there's people that commend themselves or compare each other with each other, and that's how you saw that I'm a bad teacher, because you looked at other teachers that you like better, Right? And he's saying, that's not wise at all. Down in chapter 10, at the very end, he says, For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. What's he saying there? God commended me, guys. <laughs> Christ sent me. You see, that, that's the difference between Paul and all the other teachers. You see, it's a big difference. And so, chapter 11, verse 30. If I must needs glory, I will glory the things which concern my infirmities. The God of our Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forever, knoweth that I lie not. Why does he say that? Why well, do you have to say I'm not lying? He's been accused of lying. He's been accused of, of being the opposite of this, of uh, trying to glory in himself. He says, if I'm going to glory, I'm going to glory in my infirmities. And so that, that's his, his true intent. Uh, chapter 12, verse 11 I have become a fool of glory. Ye have, ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Can you see Paul's, <laughs> as he's dealing with their fleshly accusations, he's, he's responding, he even says a few places, I answer as a fool, you know. But then he almost backtracks immediately because he's, he's trying to operate under grace. And he says here that uh, I'm not behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. I, I'm nothing. I really am nothing, Right. But he's making, trying to make the point to them that in all these areas, I, I'm not behind these guys. And of course, we use this verse like here to show Paul's apostleship. Because finally, Paul's given his credentials, you know. But he's doing this reluctantly. He wouldn't do this in any other, any other situation because it's not about his credentials, right? He's only doing it at the Corinthian church because he's been falsely accused. And he's defending the Corinthians for their sake and for their growth, right? And he's acting the fool, even says so. You want to glory in your flesh? I can glory in the flesh too, though you don't glory in the flesh. That's his lesson. Right? Similar to Philippians chapter 2 and 3. Meanwhile, we see Paul's defense in this letter, and that's the point of going through these passages here. Okay? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. What's interesting is halfway through the book here, uh, and we'll see as the first section he uh, proves his own ministry. Halfway through the book, he turns the tables. And um, he, after he's been worthily approved, uh, he says, now you guys prove yourself. Right? So he kind of flips it and says, now what have you guys done? You know, and of course, there's silence. Um, and but 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he says in, in down in verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? They know that. That though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient to you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. You already started saying things, getting things ready last year. Now therefore, perform the doing of what? The things they said they were going to do last year. Perform the doing of it. That it, as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. Right? So... Love the change of mind. Now that you have a will to do what's right, you should now probably do it. Right? And he says it in such a way that, you know, this is just natural for grace, and yet you can read a year ago? I mean, it doesn't take that long to do right. You see? It's kind of a, a rebuke in here as well. Later he talks about, in verse 14, 
He says, I mean not that other men be ease. He's talking about their, their offering some contribution. And he says, I, 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 had not, I mean not that other men be ease and you burden, but by an equality. Let's, let's make it equal. That now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want. That their abundance also may be a supply for your want. Now you got to hear the context there, okay? He's not talking about today I'll pay you five bucks and tomorrow they'll pay you five bucks, you know. He's talking about the Macedonians. They're poor. Dirt poor, right? They're not going to be able to provide the Corinthians' needs, ever. But what he said earlier was that the Macedonians supplied ministry where you lacked. And so when you provide money where they lacked, and then they'll provide ministry where you lack. Right? Equal. There's a rebuke here, but you have to know what he's saying in the context. The Macedonians provided ample ministry for the Corinthians. And he's saying to the Corinthians, why don't you just equal things out? Just give some money, and it'll help everybody. You see? At the same time, he's kind of poo-pooing the idea that money is all we need, right? People tend to outline the book and say, chapter 8 and 9 is about giving. Finally, Paul talks about giving, right? Well, of course he does, but he's doing so to the Corinthians, and it's not really about the money, it's about their doing ministry work. Yes, they have money. Yes, the Corinthians were wealthy, but that's why he brings it up. They have so much of that, and they glory in that. So he says, if that's what you glory in, then why don't you offer your glory, and the other church is going to offer their glory. It's a rebuke, you see. God always wants more of your life and your time more than your money and your possessions. But um, we'll go to that more in 2 Corinthians. What are the themes of this book? So that is the purpose. Paul is defending himself against accusations by the Corinthian response to his rebuke. He's also got a few praises in there uh, of their positive response. I remember Paul is talking to um, spiritually, and I don't mean to condemn the, the whole church of Corinth like this, but simply trying to read the, the context. He calls them carnal babes. So he's speaking to children. Right, And so in doing so, it, sometimes it sounds sarcastic. Sometimes it sounds like he's being overly ironic, and yet children sometimes don't understand that. Right? You have to speak so plainly to them, it sounds silly. Right? And that's what Paul does often throughout the book, so much so that it sounds sarcastic many times. Themes in the book. The word glory shows up 25 times, more so than any other epistle of the New Testament. The word glory. And so the Corinthian issue here is what they're glorying in. Right? They're not glorying in the same things Paul is glorying in. That becomes evident as we read through 2 Corinthians. Uh, ministry is a common theme. In fact, the theme that many commentators, and rightly so, would say the book is about. Christian ministry, grace ministry. That's what this book's about. And the Corinthians needing teaching in that. Okay? Uh, so ministry or, or ministers shows up 18 times or more. Suffering and tribulation is a common theme. Chapter 1, of course, more popular as they go through suffering and God gives comfort and all that. But also the sufferings that Paul goes through that he explains and lists the sufferings that, that are included in ministry. Paul says, says to Timothy that um, you know, if you live godly, you'll suffer persecution. Second Corinthians is Paul's account and testimony of his ministry being proved as a godly ministry. And so it's, it would be you know, logical to see a lot of suffering in there, and that's what you see in Second Corinthians, a lot of suffering and tribulation in Paul's ministry. You also see a lot of boasting, and, and that happens because, again, Paul's defending himself, right? And so he's not just boasting for the sake of boasting. He's being accused. And so much like you might be accused on the, the court stand, you have to tell things whether you want to or not in order to justify yourself. Paul is doing this in defense. And so there's many times where he says, I boast, but I speak as a fool. Because the Corinthians were boasting in something. They were glorying in something. It was the wrong thing. And so Paul boasts. He says, what I boast in, what I glory in, will be Christ, will be the infirmities, will be God's grace. That's my boast. That's my glory. But that's a common theme. A uh, heart shows up 11 times because Paul's constantly referring to their heart, the purpose of your heart, because this is where grace works in the inner man, you know, as you purpose in your heart outward. And as Paul does things and he sees uh, opposition, rejection, refusal, it's the heart that he has from God's word working effectually in him, in his heart, that is going to keep him going. As we see in chapter 4 and 5, he talks about him fainting not, I don't faint I don't, you know, we faint, not why. Because there's some things that he knows that it has in his heart that he believes. So that goes through. Uh, this proving idea is very popular, as I mentioned before. Uh, Paul having to prove himself and then turning to the Corinthians saying, prove yourself. Prove yourself to be a, a godly minister or not. The Corinthians were accusing him of not being one. Comfort, which has to do with strength or glory, shows up uh, many times. Joy and rejoicing shows up as well. You might think that odd in a book about suffering and tribulation, but it does, it's not when you think about it. Remember the, Philippi, the book of the Philippians? Uh, joy and rejoicing shows up more times than any other epistle 
in this book other than Philippians, which is all about joy, um, because Paul was in jail and the Philippians were worried about him in jail. And he's talking about joy and middle suffering. So in this book, when he's talking about the sufferings of his ministry, proving his ministry, he's also throughout talking about the joy and rejoicing that he has, what he glories and what he rejoices in. So that's there. And uh, Satan also shows up in here three times. More than any other epistle that Paul writes, Satan shows up. So we'll be reading about him and his ministry as Paul uh, is dealing with whether or not his ministry is of God or not, right? He's going to have to prove himself to be of God and then to identify what the ministry of Satan is. This is the ministry of Satan. This is the ministry of God. And he's doing this as speaking to children because they're accusing him of having a devilish ministry, not even knowing what it is. All they know is that you said something hard that hurt my feelings, shed a tear, you must be not of God. Right? Christians wouldn't do that. Well, what a Christian do exactly? Well, 2 Corinthians is the answer, right? And uh, what it is, is fight, it's fighting a battle. It's, it's tough. It's hard. It's, it takes a lot of grace working in you. It takes a lot of trust on God, joying in the right things, right? Uh, that's what Christian ministry looks like. Not something easy. Uh, I put Paul in your outline there as a theme. Um, you say, well, he's the writer, obviously. But I, I mean personally in this book. In a lot of his epistles, he's writing doctrine about like Galatians, law and grace, right? Or Romans, salvation. But in this epistle, Paul puts himself as the subject quite often, right? He'll put himself there. Like, this is what I was thinking. This is what I was doing. This is why I did it. And he's talking about himself. And so in this book especially, if you're learning about Paul, um, you'll learn about his personality, the way he responds to things the way he thinks about things in this epistle. It's very interesting. And so Paul is also a common theme, Paul the person, because the book measures his ministry and thus him. He describes his own ministry. Um, a common theme, or perhaps a, the, the umbrella theme throughout the whole book may be something like this, that um, in Christian ministry, you both need to minister and you need to be ministered to, right? And uh, who is sufficient for this? Well, God is. Because when you're doing Christian ministry, you're not just an endless well of helping other people, right? Neither are you just an endless well of wisdom and discernment. Uh, you need ministered to. You see, well, where does this come from? And this is what Paul deals with. I mean, he's the apostle of grace, right? How does he get ministered to? And he explains many times different churches that helped him. He says in the very first chapter how the Corinthians helped him, right? And yet he praises God for it. It says, God is sufficient for these things, and it's God working in you guys, and in those guys, and these guys that have helped me through these things. You see, and so we'll learn about that, uh, Christian, just Christian ministry and, the, and the, the issues therein throughout this epistle. So that's the theme. Uh, a few more things, then we'll close today's introduction. Uh, one is, I mentioned before, the benefit of reading the context, or all the verses around these very popular verses in, in this book, and I did not list them all, but 2 Corinthians is very quotable uh, because Paul is writing personally from his personal experience many times. It's very poetic, the things he writes. I don't mean that in the spiritualized sense. I mean, um, they're like bookmark verses, you know, like posters on your workplace. You know, this is what you put up there, you know. Uh, persecuted, but not, you know, cast down, but not destroyed. Perplexed, but not, you know, not, not, not dead and this sort of thing. Um, look at chapter 1, verse 3. Some very well-known Passages in this epistle. We'll just skim through them here. You'll be familiar with them, no doubt. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. There it is, the God of all comfort. All right? Let's pray. The God, God we serve as a God of all comfort. Popular bookmark verse. Chapter 2, verse 17. We already read, We are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, uh, but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Okay, chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You heard that one, right? Very popular verse, talking about the Holy Spirit and his personality and all that. Um, chapter 3, you'll, you'll, you'll find very interesting. It's one of the controversial passages in the book. Chapter 4, verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. I mean, that, that's the one right there. You put that on your wall in the morning, you know. Uh, that, that, that's the verse you quote. Uh, chapter 4, verse 16 through 18, very popular once again. Which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporal, the things which are not seen are eternal. Popular? Yeah. 
you know, the eternal perspective and this sort of thing comes from this passage here. Um, what's the context, of course? It's Paul defending his ministry and the motivations for why he's doing things. And he's going to say here, it's eternity that motivates me. And he explains why. Um, chapter 5, verse 6 and 8. We are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight, which is like a popular passage within a popular passage. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, which is uh, very comforting to people. The quote, five, chapter 5, verse 17, maybe the most popular passage in the, in the whole book. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things become new. Right? Behold, all things become new. So, very popular. Um, Understood very differently when you rightly divide the scripture, right? But a very popular passage. You can go on and read the rest of 2 Corinthians 5 there. It includes very popular passages, especially the last one. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. And we love to quote that referring to how the gospel works in salvation. Why does is, why is, why is Paul have it here? <laughs> it's hard to tell sometimes. And we're going to study through that. Chapter 6, verse 14. Be not unequally yoked. And that's pretty much all people know. <laughs> right? Uh, with unbelievers, as it says. People, sometimes people know that one. But be not unequally yoked. That's a popular passage. Or verse 17, be ye separate. Right? In the context there of Paul talking about separation. Why is that there? I mean, they seem like random bookmarked verses, don't they? I mean, what's connecting chapter 5 to chapter 6, where he goes from, you know, a new creature to be separate? Uh, we'll, we'll study that out. Uh, where are we at? Chapter 7, verse 10. Bookmark verse. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. Godly sorrow is something people often quote. Chapter 9, verse 7. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. There are songs written about that verse. Right? Why is it there? Uh, chapter 10, verse 4. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Interesting. Popular passages. Uh, chapter 11, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, and on and on. Those are the perils in verse 26. And perils of waters, and perils of robbers, and perils of my own countrymen, and perils of the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren. And it goes on and on. A very popular passage talking about the perils of Paul. Um, chapter 12, verse 9. What did Jesus say to Paul when he besought him thrice? My grace is sufficient, right? Even not in grace circles. This is a very popular passage in Corinthians. My grace is sufficient. Um, often wrongly heard, I think. People tend to think Jesus is limiting Paul to what he's giving him. Not so at all. What he's saying is there's nothing that can happen to you that I can't help with. That's the idea that he is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. His grace is what God gave. Anyway, we'll get to that in chapter 12 some year from now. There's some controversial passages in the book. Uh, chapter 2, verse 6, talks about a punishment, and uh, the punishment they gave the guy was worthy, and so that's kind of controversial, because, what? Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many? What's that mean? What happened, and what's the situation where we all get sticks and rods and go afflict someone sufficiently? <laughs> you know, when does that happen? It's a very controversial, people debate what's going on there. Chapter 3, verse 3, is something we'll spend some time with. Uh, because it's a controversy close to home with the New Testament that Paul quotes in verse 6, right? But uh, verse 3 through 6 there, where he says that you are the epistle of Christ ministered by us. And then in down in verse 5, or we are sufficient of ourselves to think, uh, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. So very controversial passage there, debated about what that means. Um, we'll deal with that as we get to it. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. This is a topic people pull right out of 2 Corinthians, have no idea in the context of it, but they like to pull it out because they want to discuss things in eternity and whether or not we have bodies or, or do have bodies and everything else. We know that if our hurt, earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 
for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. What does that mean? And you die and not have a body, and you're floating around like a spirit, and do you have a shape and everything else? And people debate and, and controverse over these passages. It had nothing to do with the context, right, of why Paul even wrote about it. But they debate about it. Chapter 9, verse 6 is controversial. Um, not only because it's dealing with money, but because it's dealing with, uh, apparently, a sounding, a, a, some sort of a, a lever on money here. It says, This I say, he which sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. That's right before Paul says, Give us your purpose in your heart. So we quote verse 7, and we skip right over verse 6, where you might have to think twice about that, because it sounds like Paul's saying, If you give more money, God will bless you more. And if you don't, he won't. Right? What is that talking about? People argue about that. Chapter 12, verse 1 through 4, maybe the, perhaps the most controversial section, or at least the, the most irrelevant, trivial section that people spend the most time on. It's chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to, caught up to the third heaven which gives us historical information about there being three heavens, right? And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how they was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. Who is the man and what did he hear? And you spend hours wasting your life trying to figure this out. And it's not important in the Bible. It really isn't, especially in the context of 2 Corinthians, right? Um, there are solutions and options, and we might deal with that a little bit, but it's not why Paul is writing about it. Right. So, anyway, those are the controversies. There's also some unknown verses. As Paul says, uh, unknown yet well-known. There are unknown passages in this book that people don't quote very often. They're very significant, and we'll hit those as well. In chapter 1, verse 9, he talks about the reason why he goes through sufferings is so that he would trust in God and not himself, which I think is something we all need to have memorized. We had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead. Why do you go through sufferings? Right? Apart from the dispensational reason, which is grace, the practical reason is that you might trust God. That's why. Because you have a choice during that suffering whether to trust God or not. Either you think God didn't think about this moment in time and me personally, and so apparently life is overwhelming to me, or you know that God is omniscient and omnipotent and sees the end from the beginning and knows exactly what I needed and provided for it in his word. Those are your choices. Either trust God or don't, right? And so a uh, very important verse people don't have memorized at all. Um, chapter 5, verse 16, something very important, where right before the popular passage, Paul says, Henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him, Christ, no more after the flesh. Very, a lot of implications in this verse here, or, or conclusions, rather, from that. Very important. Chapter 8, verse 14. Oh, I read that one to you already. We won't go there. Chapter 10, verse 18. I read that to you already, too. You see, I'm already giving you the unknown passages. Not he that commendeth himself as approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. That proves Paul's apostleship. Chapter 11, verse 19. For ye suffer fools glad gladly, seeing yourselves are wise. You see, when people miss some of these passages because they're missing the emotions in this book, the sarcasm Paul has, the personality that's in here, and the rebuke. Here's a rebuke and sarcasm. Ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. Well, if you're wise, you don't suffer fools, Right? They think they're wise in rebuking Paul. And Paul says, you suffer fools. That's because you're wise. He's being sarcastic and he's rebuking them, right? Uh, but people read right over this some of that stuff. Uh, we'll get to it. Here's 12, verse uh, 12 through 16, are passages people miss that are very important. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it that wherein you were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. That is sarcastic. How, how, in what way were you inferior? Except I didn't charge you money. Forgive me for that. I should have charged you money, right? Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you, for the children ought not to lay it for the parents, but the parents for the children. Everybody knows that. Raw. <laughs> uh, that happens when they're babies, right? But not when they grow up. Uh, verse 15, I will very gladly spend to be spent for you, 
Oh, the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. But be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. All playing tricks here, chapter number 16. So having some fun there at the end. I guess that's why he wraps up the book pretty quickly. He saw himself, you know, maybe getting too hard. But uh, chapter 13, verse 2. That's where he, I, the verse I read earlier where he, he, uh, he, he almost threatens him there to say, look, you better stop sinning. Because so, if I come again, I don't want to come with you sinning. I'll give you a brief outline of the book at the bottom of, of your first page. Uh, good luck in creating your own. Hopefully we'll, we'll make it more clear to you. I'll put a detailed outline at the back of the page, uh, at least um, uh, the best I can at the moment. But uh, there's generally three sections. Uh, people will break up the book between chapters 1 to 7. And they'll say that's something to do with Paul's ministry or God comforting him and that sort of thing. And then chapter 8, verse, chapter eight and 9, they say this is about giving. There's the money verse chapters. And then 10 through 13, this is about Paul dealing with false teachers, which of course is all true, except that I think it's very disjunct. In trying to bring it all together and why these things exist the way they do, I said that the first six chapters is Paul's ministry approved by the sufficiency and glory of Christ. That's what he's doing in the first six chapters, approving his own ministry. Chapter 7 and nine, through 9, then, he's actually challenging the Corinthian church to prove their ministry. He brings up money, yes, but also just them proving themselves over and over again. Prove your love, prove your sincerity, prove your grace. In chapter 10 through 13, he actually ends with saying, guys, look, I have authority given from the Lord Jesus Christ to teach you right doctrine and to go to the Corinthian church and teach you stuff. I was there and started the church, and Christ gave me authority as an apostle of the Gentiles to go to you guys, and so you need to listen to me. Essentially what he says in the last th three chapters of the book. Which is why it, he says in chapter 11, I'm jealous over you because they're his responsibility, right? In chapter 12, which is why he says, I'm, an, I'm your apostle. In chapter 13, he says, I'm going to come to you again. And when I come, yeah, make sure you clean your room, <laughs> you know. So that's essentially what Paul says because he's responsible for them. So that's my brief outline. Um, hopefully that sparked some interest in the book with you. And uh, as we go through it verse by verse, we'll start with chapter 1 next week. And uh, hopefully we'll grow by the same way that the Corinthians should have grown. Any questions? Any comments? Any thoughts? It'll be good. Fun stuff. All right. Lord, we thank you for a church like the Corinthians. We thank you for your grace working in them, working in the Apostle Paul. And that same grace, that same power can work in us today. And we thank you for this book that we can study and learn from other people's mistakes and also learn from other people's lives so that we can redeem the time to serve you as ambassadors, do a proper ministry of your grace and of you to bring you glory and to edify your church and so that we can uh, uh, have the hope of glory for eternity that you promise us. Amen.